Hello and welcome to People and Profit. I'm Charles Pellegrin, and this week a special edition from VivaTech, France's largest annual tech conference. And a great opportunity for us to zero in on the advent of artificial intelligence and what it'll mean for people and businesses around the world. Whether it's ramping up automation on the production line or crafting a sales pitch or leveling the playing field for people with disabilities, it's hard to imagine any sector not being impacted by it. But first off, let's get a sense of the big picture. And we're now joined on set by Beatrice San Saiz of EY, one of the world's biggest professional services suppliers in the world. She's the global consulting and AI leader there and someone who's seen the many different ways in which AI could change the face of business and the economy. Thank you so much for being with us on the program. My pleasure to be here, thank you. So uh, Beatrice, you've argued that gen generative AI, uh, the kind of AI produced by ChatGPT, for instance, uh, will bring about more equality. Can you explain this to us? I'm, I'm actually uh, quite positive about it. Uh, equality is driven by two aspects. Uh, one is education uh, and giving access to education to the whole population uh, is a breakthrough. And the second thing, and I think we have already data uh, to confirm that, I mean, AI uh, is impacting in terms of productivity uh, boost most on the lower skill workers. Um, think about, for example, a, a software engineer that all in the sudden has access to all libraries of code. Uh, their productivity can go up 40%, while, for example, in the more high skill workers, that productivity increase or improve will go just kind of a 10%. But what about, uh, you know, we're talking about equality, what about inclusivity and diversity? How do you make sure concerns, for example, over gender parity are taken into consideration as AI is included into, into business practices? We are still behind. Uh, I think only uh, less than 3% of the working uh, population is working in technology. Uh, and out of that, I think more than 80% are male. I think I'm also positive on that uh, on that side, and I'm, I'm an example, and I can see uh, more and more females uh, that, uh, especially uh, in the last few years, accelerated by the transformation of data and AI. I tend to say that this is the, the we are the architects of the future, uh, and typically women uh, like to leave legacy. So, what a best place to leave legacy than technology. The AI is only as good as the data that it's being trained on, and that's one of the big issues we've seen with some algorithms that we're not even sure why end up having discriminatory practices because of the data that's being used. And how do you make sure the AI takes these, these things into consideration? I mean, 100% uh, bias, uh, as we call it. it. It has been identified, I think, early, quite early in the journey as uh, one of the, the potential risk uh, of, uh, of this technology, training an algorithm with bad data will only produce uh, the same bad data. Uh, there's a lot of investment, and that's the good news. Uh, there's a lot of investment going to solve that issue. First, from a technology perspective, there are new techniques, uh, adversarial networks, that are almost kind of challenging models when uh, uh, some bias, for example, are, uh, are appearing. Uh, so kind of that's one sense. Uh, but it's ultimately the responsible AI frameworks, the uh, companies, the governments, uh, and the regulation itself, uh, they are investing in new, uh, new risk frameworks uh, to make you know, AI uh, more uh, responsible. Maybe we actually jumped ahead here by talking about equality or diversity, uh, because for most businesses, AI uh, at first will mean cost cutting, will mean uh, cutting down on expenses. Uh, how, it's hard to imagine that this won't actually affect a lot of people who, for example, uh, perform these what we call routine tasks. How do we ensure it's not as destructive as it could be? The fear is there, uh, and there's a lot of talk about the bad AI or AI cutting jobs. I think it's important to put things in perspective. Uh, AI is, uh, is boosting uh, global GDP around $4 trillion in the next uh, 10 years. So that's equivalent to two economies of the G7 coming into play. So despite of geopolitics, from an enterprise perspective, uh, we are uh, in, an, in a growth scenario, so that means uh, more opportunities, uh, more jobs. 
there are new industries that are about to be reinventing. So for example, uh, the industry around uh, hardware, uh, it's, it's a bottleneck today. That is industry will be fundamentally kind of reinvented. There are new jobs uh, coming in. And so, and ultimately, I, I don't know, if I have an AI uh, improving my productivity like uh, uh, 40, 50 percent, I wouldn't mind uh, working two days uh, or three days a week. So sometimes, somehow, we might need to bring back some of the debates or the discussions that you know were somehow kind of uh, close a few years back. Beatrice Sanzais uh, from EY, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, up next, France 24's tech editor Peter O'Brien scours the halls of Viva Tech to find out what the rise of AI means for climate tech. Here at Viva Tech, artificial intelligence is being put to task to serve our climate and our environment through a variety of different innovations that promise to help us reduce our waste, improve our energy efficiency and much more in between. We have a project with uh, autonomous drones that go over uh, wind turbines and uh, solar power plants to identify defects. And we use computer vision both to navigate aut autonomously in those uh, power plants, as well as identify those anomalies. We use artificial intelligence and machine learning in our sorting centers to make sure that the quality of sorted waste is good and then the recycling um, quantity and the recycling efficiency will be the best. When it comes to energy use, often the elephant in the room is the data centers used to run and to train these AI models, which are increasingly energy and water intensive. But of course, here at VivaTech, there are proposed solutions to this as well. The electricity consumption is a problem, but I think the more we use renewable power and the more we use the waste heat coming from the data centers, the better it is for the future. This is our GPU cooler. And this system makes it possible to operate the data center without air conditioning. Now, NGOs like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace say that even if the AI industry increases by 10% the efficiency of its data centers, if it doubles the amount of data centers there are, that would increase greenhouse gas emissions around the world by up to 80%. But I've asked lots of businesses today here at Viva Tech, and they've told me that the productivity gains promised by AI will actually reduce our impact on the climate and our carbon emissions. What we have to remember, though, is that people here at Viva Tech this year are here because of AI, because of the hype it's generating, and fundamentally, because they want to buy and sell AI tools. Well, Peter O'Brien, France 24's uh, tech editor, reporting there. And now I'm joined on set by Olivier Oulier. He's the co-founder of French startup Inclusive Brains and the chairman of the Institute for Artificial Intelligence by Biotech Dental. Uh, Olivier, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Inclusive Brains has developed an interface called Prometheus, uh, which uh, is able to read brain waves and other neurophysical data and translate it into concrete commands thanks to uh, electrodes placed on the brain, for instance. So this allows people with disabilities who don't have uh, use of their hands to use computers or, for instance, uh, to carry the Olympic torch during the torch relay, which is something that happened uh, recently uh, thanks to an exoskeleton. So uh, thank you so much for speaking to us on People and Profit. I, I want to start with one thing here. The objective is, is to help bring in more uh, disabled people uh, into the workforce, at least open up more, jo more jobs to disabled people. Um, how can they access this technology? What's the first step for disabled people here? This is very high-tech technology that is quite expensive. And the first step for us was to develop this technology, but second, to find the right partner that allows us to industrialize it but also to open the doors of workplaces and education, because it's not just helping people reaccess or rejoin the workforce, it's also about people being able to have access to education. So we partnered with Allianz Trade, the global leader in um, trade credit insurance, in order to be able not only to have this project with the Olympic Torch Relay, but to take this technology in the workplace, to leverage the combination of artificial intelligence and neuroscience in order to improve inclusivity. The remote control was invented for people with disabilities so that they could control their television set. But then it changed 
entirely the way you and I and billions of people around the world interact with technology. And it became a massive market. So what we aspire to be doing in the next years is by empowering machines to adapt to how we feel and how we are, regardless of our physicality, needs, and abilities, however special these might be, we want machines to adapt to us. And what is happening today with artificial intelligence is not enough. Generative artificial intelligence, the way most of us are using it, is about understanding and recreating language. But look at our, the way I interact with you. I'm using my hands, my facial expressions. You are nodding. There is so much than words in the way we interact with humans and the way we interact with machines. I, I want to take a step back here a little bit to one thing you said earlier, that in this road to develop Prometheus, you, uh, you have the support now of a huge credit insurance company. Absolutely. Why, what's in it for them? What's the link between a credit insurance company and what you do with the inclusive brains? What's in for them? is also to understand how we can leverage this technology not only to empower people with disability, but everyone. Hence what I mentioned earlier regarding the remote control. First you work for people with special needs and then you can help the entire workforce. Because the artificial intelligence that we've been developing by integrating facial expressions, brain waves, prosody, which is the intonation of my voice, my movements, the way I breathe heartbeats into the models, for us, it's a way to try to develop artificial intelligence that works as close as possible to the functioning of our human brain. And it can help everyone. True inclusivity means developing technology and solutions that benefit everyone with zero discrimination whatsoever. Olivier Ollier, you are the co-founder of French uh, Marseille Startup. Marseille uh, Startup. Brains. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for this week. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us on social media. In the meantime, thank you for watching and stay tuned.